Hey everybody, Ryan Feldman here, emergency medicine pharmacist and clinical toxicologist. I just released a video of a virtual resuscitation video game that I made a few years ago um, where we have a digital cardiovascular system that's completely interactive with itself. Afterload affects cardiac output, preload affects cardiac output, uh, cardiac output affects blood pressure, all of these really fun things. And you get to identify patients' shock phenotypes and manage them with vasopressors. And the vasopressors have specific parameters of how they're going to affect the patient's cardiac output, afterload, and preload uh, based off of evidence, as well as other fun things like evidence-based odds ratios for going to an arrhythmia, all sorts of fun things. Uh, so I put this out, and I wanted to put out with it a quick tutorial video on how to play the game. So that's what this video is. It's going to be really easy. The game is super fun, but it can look intimidating if you don't know how to navigate around the screen. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do is actually find the game itself. I think the easiest way to do this is to go to www.thepoisonlab.com. This is the website for my toxicology podcast. Some of you may have listened to already, but it's a lot easier than finding the game on the internet. Go to Medical Games and Resources. And then you're going to go to Toxo's Resuscitation Game, click Play Game, and here we are. Now you can run the game. So here we are. Excuse the uh, music. It's a little 80s, but I like it a lot. Okay, so we are at Our Lady of Pixels Hospital, and here it says, We have many critically ill patients. Do you think you can help us keep them alive? So just to orient yourself to this page, this is the main game. You click the doors here to enter the hospital and play beds. This shock tank is another part of the game that we added, that I added, when, when uh, I wanted people to be able to replay shock states after they had defeated them in the game. So you can come here after you've beaten a shock state to use this. Then we have training and resources. Uh, I'll go into these afterwards, but it has things like review of uh, vasopressors, so a written review of all sorts of what shock is, the different phenotypes of shock, the different components of the cardiovascular system, as well as uh, how pressors affect those different components, and evidence for how to manage the different types of shock. There's also a YouTube video right here. If you click this button, it's not count. It's not very intuitive. You click this, and it pops open with the URL that you can copy and paste in your browser to find a YouTube video on how to manage shock. We'll go back. The other thing that is in here um, is an ACLS practice scenario, and I'll show you what uh, how we can use that after we play through. So once you're actually in here, you're going to click the doors to enter. Our badge is going to say "Super Cool Guy and or Gal." Okay. And your second favorite nurse sees you walk in. As you can tell, I may have designed some random uh, descriptors as well as people who greet you when you walk in. Dr. Super Cool Guy and or Gal, I'm glad you're here. I have a feeling today is going to be a nightmare. There's five patients waiting for you. So now you could choose a bed. These are hyperlinks, bed four, five, four, three, two, one. You choose whichever one you want. We're going to go ahead and do, uh, oh, let's do bed two. Okay, you enter just in time to see a man being wheeled in by paramedics. You can see the paramedics say, this is Mr. Starling, a 55-year-old male with multiple extremity stab wounds and a small thoracic laceration from a knife sharpener. Okay, in order to see the different patient information, you're just going to click on it. So somebody assesses the airway. It sounds like he's not responding. He's not reponding. You will find a few typos here and there to the person who's assessing his airway. Okay, let's get his GCS score. It seems like, if you want the chart, here it is. They're not responding to verbal, they're decerebrate posturing, and his eyes open to voice. Interesting, not a usual thing that you would see, but we have one for verbal, two for motor, three for eyes, so their GCS is six. Okay, vital signs, I have a heart rate of 111, a MAP of 47, respiratory rate of four, and a pulse ox of 87%. This seems primarily like we have an airway problem, but we certainly have a, a circulation problem too. You can see it. he's got normal reactive pupils. His skin is mottled and pale, but there's numerous lacerations bilaterally. And on his abdomen, 
soft, non-tender, no guarding. So now we could choose our first intervention. We can give blood, we can give saline, or we can intubate. Right now, you can only choose one of these. Uh, given that I think he's extremely hypotensive, I'm going to actually, in, uh, I'd like to start blood and intubate at the same time, but I, I'm just going to intubate. Okay, so the patient is intubated and we proceed with their trauma exam. We now have invasive hemodynamics. So this is what you would see if you had a swan gans in or potentially um, a central venous line as well as something to monitor cardiac output and afterload. So here I see all of his places. We're going to just go to continue resuscitation. So pressure is applied to his extremity wound with a small amount of active bleeding. It's bandaged and wrapped to control the bleed and no other wounds appear to be actively bleeding. Chest radiograph shows no, medias, uh, no mediastinum. A chest radiograph shows a normal mediastinum and is negative for hemo or pneumothorax. Let's look at his vitals. Okay, wow, we intubated him and his map really tanked down to 21. But now we have a pulse ox, which is hopefully improving. We'll see what happens. Because you're at a teaching hospital, a pulmonary artery catheter, arterial line, and central venous line are placed. So now we get to see all of our invasive hemodynamics. Okay, I can see I have a central venous pressure of 2, yikes, stroke volume 10, ejection fraction 8%, okay. So let's go ahead and scroll all the way down. What do those mean? If you don't know or aren't familiar with invasive hemodynamics, these are, these are kind of the measurements you might get in a patient in the cardiovascular ICU who has a Swan-Gans catheter in. You can measure their preload, you can measure their cardiac output and their systemic vascular resistance. So preload, output, and afterload. If you're not familiar with the values, you can go all the way down to the bottom and click for normal hemodynamic values. So in this patient, I see that he has a CVP of 2, and a normal is 8 to 12. So I see he has a very severely depressed preload. Okay, In the setting of trauma, this probably means he is in hemorrhagic shock. He also has a very low cardiac output. Well, we know our cardiac output is equal to, let's see if we have it here somewhere. We don't. Oh, right here. Cardiac output is equal to heart rate times stroke volume. Well, stroke volume is dependent on preload, which I know is very down. So his cardiac output is low because his stroke volume is low. Then I see that his afterload is actually 621 dynes. That's pretty high. When I look at this, so he's got a high afterload, low preload, low cardiac output. Let's figure out what kind of shock he has. Here, these quick references will follow you along to every page. You can click them to see the different beta and alpha properties of your vasopressors, as well as the different changes in your preload, cardiac output, and afterload based off the shock type you're dealing with. Here I've got low preload, low cardiac output, and high afterload. This seems like hypovolemic shock. You can also click here to see what the normal dose ranges are of your vasopressors and how much you increase the dose of your vasopressor each time you click the radio button. So if I were to start norepinephrine right now, it would increase him by 0.05 mic per kilo per minute. In fact, you know, I think this guy is a, 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 a hypovolemic shock, but we're here in the resuscitation bay. This is where we can play. This is where we can watch the effects of vasopressors and how they affect the cardiovascular system. So normally I would treat this patient with blood but let's see what happens if we treat him with norepinephrine. So norepinephrine actually increased his dynes. This is his afterload, which norepinephrine, remember, has both beta and alpha. If we look over here, it's primarily alpha, but there is a little bit of beta 1. So it looks like it increased his heart rate slightly, as well as his stroke volume slightly and that increased his, uh, as well as his afterload, and that increased his blood pressure. So his MAP went up to 23. What if we give him just phenylephrine? Ooh, so phenylephrine. So as you can see, each time what's going on here is I'm just clicking this. You can click any of these. You can click each one of these or just one, and then click reassess to see the effects that it has on your vital signs. So when I clicked phenylephrine, I saw that my afterload went up, my cardiac output was decreased because, let's go down here, click for normal hemodynamic values. 
we know that stroke volume is decreased with increased afterload. It's more pressure that the heart has to put it, push against. So I can see my stroke volume is decreased because I've increased my afterload. But I think he really just, well, I'll give him a little fluid now, okay? Actually, blood, because that's what he probably lost. So let's go ahead and do that. Wow, all right. So what happened? I gave him a unit of blood. His CVP went up to three. This increased his ejection fraction. As we know, the Frank Starling curve shows that my stroke volume is dependent on my preload. So as I continue to increase my preload, I'm going to keep increasing my ejection fraction. And that is going to increase cardiac output, leading to an increase in my MAP. But we're having fun, and I'm just showing you what can happen. Let's go ahead and do phenylephrine and vasopressin. So now my dynes are 1861. That's pretty high. He has a really high afterload, and that tanked my cardiac output because I have more to push against now. Once again, something we don't want to do. And now it looks like the patient's middle finger is white and poorly perfused. So it seems like we've clamped him down too much. Let's drop those doses. I'm going to get rid of his fennel and I'm going to stop his vasopressin. So you can click those buttons in order to, you can click the decrease dose or the stop dose in order to remove them. So let's go ahead and do that and see what happens. All right, phenylephrine is now back down to one. Hmm, just to show you what really happens, we'll do this one more time. Uh-oh, his middle finger now looks white and poorly perfused. The longer you have your afterload too high, the more fingers you're going to lose, and the game does keep track. But okay, so I don't need pressors to manage a hem hemorrhagic shock, so I'm going to get rid of all this stuff, decrease my doses, stop all of this stuff, and I'm just going to give him blood. Let's see what happens. As I give him blood, his preload increases. His cardiac output then increases due to an increase in stroke volume. You actually see his heart rate going down, and that's because as his stroke volume is increasing, his heart rate does not need to compensate so much to increase his cardiac output. My afterload is already maxed out. Let's just keep giving our friend some blood. And he needs some post-intubation sedation as well. All right, he's responding really well to blood. Our preload is increasing. This is great. Our map is 55. I'm going to give him a little more. Uh, we are actually now at three units of whole blood. Let's do some tranexamic acid too. Ooh, and look, this is a great idea because it reduces. <laughs> we do have some evidence-based guidelines built right into this, so that's fun. Okay, it reduces blood blood utilization. All right, my map is 66. All I've done really is give blood. He's still in phenylephrine. I <laughs> didn't mean to leave him on that. But you can see this is an environment where you can play and see exactly what is going to happen to their different cardiovascular parameters if you were to manage that shock that's hemorrhagic with say vasopressors and this is a fun place to do it so there we go we said you managed to get your patients mapped to 65 with only nine rounds of titrations you did not correctly identify the shock that's because i just said it was cardiogenic you would get to choose and then here you can review your basics if you need to which we don't and then it tracks the patients you saved the fingers you lost the patients you kill and you get a badge at the end of it. Deputy of volume. Once you actually unlock that actual case, then you can go into the shock tank, choose a case like hypovolemic. So you've beaten this one, so you can play it. If you haven't beaten it, let's say you try to do cardiogenic, you try to generate your simulation, it's not time yet because you haven't unlocked the module. So then you can reset it or go back. We're gonna reset the hypovolemic. Okay, we'll enter the sim. Okay, now we have a new patient, Miss Patel, 38-year-old woman involved in a trampling at the mall during Black Friday. Her airway is patent, her GCS is 12. This is great. Look at her vitals. Everything looks good, except her MAP is 20, her heart rate's 111, her PO2 is 89. Maybe she does need some oxygen. Pupils are normal and reactive. Skin, mottled and pale. Number of lacerations, very similar. We're gonna give her a unit of packed red blood cells. And a fast is done that's negative. You can see your vitals still looking pretty bad. Here's my invasive parameters. Low preload, low output, high afterload. Well, we're going to put her on oxygen because we know that she has a uh, PO2 of 89%. And then we're going to resuscitate. So I'll give her blood. But what if I say decide to give her dobutamine? 
Well, look at that. Dobutamine, an inodilator, as we know, because it has beta-1 and beta-2 effects, and especially at higher doses, we see more beta-2. It reduced her afterload and increased her cardiac output. Maybe I could treat her just with dobutamine. Not a great idea, but let's do it. Okay, actually, in this case, she just needed to get her heart rate up really high. This isn't how you would normally manage this case, but you can see the idea. Okay, so if you really give them too much stuff, they end up going into VTAC, which is no fun. Uh, and then you get to practice managing VTAC with a pulse and VTAC without a pulse, uh, as well as standard ACLS. Here it talks more about what the shock was, uh, how you treated it, and get your prize. Woo. So since I didn't put anyone into VTAC, there's our badge collection on our patient safe, let's go try out the VTAC or the ACLS simulator. So in here, in this mode, drug therapies only appear when ACLS actually recommends you to use them. In the game, you can use them anytime. Uh, but in this case, it makes you stick to the guidelines. So here I have a patient with a wide complex tachycardia and pulse check says there is no detectable femoral pulse. So if you need help, here's your guidelines. We have the ACLS cardiac arrest algorithm and we have the tachycardia with a pulse algorithm if they have a pulse. So here I am, start CPR. If it's shockable, shock them. Then do more CPR and shock them again. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna perform CPR. Charge for direct current cardioversion. We're down our two minutes. I'm shocking. We resume CPR. Now we're on to cycle two. I see I'm wide complex and I have no detectable femoral pulse. So same thing. Charge, shock, resume. Okay. Now we're on cycle three. I still am wide complex, no pulse. Let's do a milligram of epinephrine now, which is what they would recommend in the cardiac arrhythmia algorithm. Here we go, epi every three to five after two shocks. So I'm performing CPR, I'm giving epi, I'm charging, shocking, and immediately resuming CPR. All right, now we're on to cycle four, still no pulse, still in wide complex tachycardia. Now we're gonna do some amiodarone, which will be the next. Okay, perform CPR, charge. I'm gonna do some epi too, because I happen to have built the game, and I know that if you do more interventions, Assuming they're not dangerous, it increases your odds of achieving normal sinus rhythm. So we're going to prepare Amio 300 and give it. We could do Lido as well, but you know I'm more of an Amio fan right now, as it's out of hospital. Resume CPR. Woo! Okay, now we have a rhythm change. We have normal sinus rhythm, but there's still no detectable femoral pulse. So now we are moving into the pulseless electrical activity uh, or algorithm, in which case CPR and epinephrine. Let's do it. And that's all we can do. So then you're going to click Reassess Pulse and Rhythm. There we go. Still the same thing. We're in pulseless electrical activity. Beautiful normal sinus rhythm, but we're just not perfusing. And unfortunately, you only have five rounds to really get them back with a pulse. And since this patient didn't get a pulse, that's the end. You call the ECMO team. They don't want to cannulate. Despite numerous therapies and many experimental things such as steroids, vasopressin, and epinephrine, ROSC is not obtained. And that's okay, because that's a fun place to work on your ACLS skills. Or you can induce them in a patient by, say, your second favorite security guard sees you walk in and says, hey, they're wheeling a patient in right now. Let's do bed three. A pale, diaphoretic man clutching his chest. He's minimally responsive. Ryan, he's 48, he was shoveling his driveway when he began to have severe radiating epigastric pain and his wife drove him here. Okay, diabetes, hypertension, takes metformin. Here's his vitals, his map, uh, needs some oxygen and he needs some blood pressure support. Physical exam, lungs are clear, skin cool and clammy, labs and imaging. Looks like his tropes elevated. His pH is 6.9. His chest radiograph is clear. A bedside TTE, or actually probably not a TTE. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, a TTE. Demonstrates the left ventricular regional wall motion abnormalities and an EF of 25%, as well as ST segment elevation 
and leads one AVL V5 and V6. So, because you're at a teaching hospital, you get a pulmonary artery catheter, A line, and central venous line. CVP is 12, stroke volume 30, EF 25, systemic vascular resistance 1299. So when we plot this out, we can see where he is. He's actually got a high normal CVP, he's got a normal dynes, and he has a low cardiac output. This is a STEMI. These are complex to deal with because he's in cardiogenic shock from oxygen mismatch. So we gotta try to keep him perfusing without straining his heart too much. I'm gonna put him on oxygen. He does have a high preload, but he's okay. I don't think I need to give him Lasix, but I will give him nitroglycerin just to help with his chest pain. And then I'm gonna start him on norepi. Why norepi? Well, let's see what happens. So looks like the nitro dropped his afterload a little bit and his preload, but the norepinephrine hopefully countered that. His cardiac output actually went up slightly, potentially from the afterload decreasing or from the norepi increasing a little bit of contractility. It's not an ino, uh, it's not an inotrope, but it does have beta agonism, and you can get both increased cardiac output or decreased. All right, we fixed his oxygen, so that's good. Let's see what happens when you give this guy a lot of, let's see, inotropy in a pretty sick heart. Right? He needs cardiac output. Let's give it to him. I'm going to give him dopamine, dobutamine, and epinephrine, and reassess. Okay. <laughs> so there is an evidence-based odds ratio for how likely it is you're going to go into an arrhythmia. And it depends on the vasopressors you're using. Uh, hint, hint, dopamine is the worst one. Okay. Wow. Well, that did help us with our cardiac output, but... Now I have a wide complex rhythm change. Let's check a pulse. Okay. There is no detectable femoral pulse. He just went into VTAC without a pulse. You know the algorithm. It says we should shock. I would do a few things here. I'm going to perform CPR. I'm going to charge for cardioversion, prepare and push amiodarone, and then shock. I know that's not what the guidelines would say, but in real life, a lot of things come at you at once. And I don't think there's any real reason to wait to give antiarrhythmic in these scenarios. Okay, I could have done lidocaine. This is a, acute coronary syndrome induced, and it's thought that that might be better for that um, because of its ability to bind better to ischemic heart tissue uh, with lower pH, but I went with amio. So we still have no pulse. It's time. We're doing more CPR. I'm going to give epi. I'm going to charge. Let's shock. Still no pulse. He's gotten one of epi, one of amio. Still wide complex. Let's do it again. And this time, I'm going to give the other 150 of amio and shock. All right. So we've converted to normal sinus rhythm, but we still have no detectable pulse. So we're in PEA. And as you know, epi and CPR. Come on. I hope. Oh, no. We can still do it one more time. Normal sinus, no pulse. Let's get him back. Let's get him back. Oh, well, now we're in VT again. So you can bring these guys back. We failed a couple of times. But as you can see in the real game, you can uh, use your interventions at different times. You don't have to do them all at once. And you can also treat patients who have a pulse, in which case things really change. So unfortunately, we contact ECMO team. They don't want to take them patient has died. So it'll track your patients you kill, the patients you save, your badges, the fingers you lost. I just wanted to orient you to, to the different things that you could see on this site uh, so it's not so intimidating if you're taking a look at it. I highly encourage you to play through, do some things you wouldn't normally do. Treat your hemorrhagic shock with vasopressin and phenylephrine. See what happens. Drop your preload to zero uh, in a cardiogenic shock patient and see what happens, or fluid overload someone until pink frothy sputum comes out. You can do it all in here, and this is the place to do it. Really, I want you to have fun identifying the defects in their preload, cardiac output, and their afterload, and then determining which type of shock it is using these quick references down here, and then figuring out how your vasopressors can complement those shock phenotypes based off of their beta 1, beta 2, and alpha profiles. So thanks for following along. I hope this video is useful and uh, you can use this 
in order to get better at managing patients with undifferentiated shock. There's also a YouTube video you can watch if you want to learn more about vasopressors and shock. Uh, I'll put a link to it here. Uh, over here, I'll put a link to it over here. Um, but that'll get, walk you through the different physiologic changes that occur in shock, as well as how our vasopressors modify those physiologic changes with they hit more beta-1 versus more alpha-1 and how we can use them to complement our shock phenotype. Thanks for following, and I hope uh, you, can, you or your learners can use this. Uh, you can play it on your phone, on your computer, or in virtual reality, as I've recently uh, released a video about.